Good evening. Welcome to the Cabarrus County Board of Education business meeting. Today is Monday, February 11th, 2019. I'll call the meeting to order and we will now introduce uh, those presenting the colors tonight. Presenting tonight's colors are members of the Central Cabarrus High School Air Force JROTC unit, including Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Jamie Ramos, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Alex Willis, Cadet Captain Kevin Robles, and Cadet Master Sar Sergeant Dean Brindle. And honoring America tonight with the playing of our national anthem are members of the Concord High School Saxophone Ensemble, including Mason Klein, Abigail Kroon, Caroline Medlin, and their director, Mr. Ed Harper. We Thank you all. You may be seated. And thank you once again to the students for uh, joining us this evening. Board members, we're ready to adopt the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve it as presented? Second. 
Mrs. Grimsey made the motion. Mr. Walter made the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes 6-0. And Mr. Shoemaker uh, is ill, so he thought he would not spread his germs with us. We appreciate that. We'll start with um, recognition. Mrs. Jones? I was just hoping they would magically appear, and they did. Good evening. The Cabarrus County Schools Teacher Assistant of the Year Program honors the contributions of pre-kindergarten through 12th grade teacher assistants to their schools, communities, and profession. The Cabarrus County Schools Teacher Assistant of the Year must meet the following eligibility requirements in order to be eligible for the North Carolina Association of Teacher Assistants uh, and the Teacher Assistant Program. The Teacher Assistant of the Year must be a member of the North Carolina Association of Teacher Assistants for two consecutive years prior to the nomination. The Teacher Assistant of the Year must be employed as a Teacher Assistant for a minimum of two years prior to the nomination. We are here this evening to celebrate and recognize our Teacher Assistants of the Year and our District Teacher Assistant of the Year. Tonight, we would like to, um, we're going to call in each one of their names individually, and at the very end, we will recognize our um, Cabarrus County Schools Teacher Assistant of the Year. I want to start with A.T. Allen Elementary School, Miss Sherry Newton. I'm going to ask that you come all the way down. Thank you. Beverly Hills STEM Elementary School, Patricia Knox. Carl A. Fur Elementary School. No, oh, I don't. I believe she's not here. Is that correct? Okay. And that's Melissa Sansbury. Charles E. Boger Elementary School. Cynthia Bethay. And I'm going to continue to just recognize maybe those that aren't here. Concord High School. Corey Graham. Cox Mill Elementary School. Uh, Nikki Michelle Malden. Got that. Harris Road Middle School. Jennifer Rothermel. Harrisburg Elementary School, Chandra White, H.E. Winkler Middle School, Jennifer Carr, Hickory Ridge High School, Gray Hoover, J.M. Robinson High School is not here with us tonight, but James McClellan, J.N. Freeze Middle School, Francis Kotanch, Mount Pleasant Elementary, Karen Thompson, Northwest Cabarrus High School, Antwalia Edmond. W.R. Odell Primary Elementary School, Ms. Kathleen Campo is not with us tonight. Patriot STEM Elementary School, Teresa Alexander. Pitts, I want to recognize Pitt School Road Elementary School, April Rebel, who she did attend our greeting upstairs but had to leave. Um, R. Brown McAllister Elementary School, Dale Janus. Rocky River Elementary School, Yolanda Spratt. Weddington Hills Elementary School, Michelle Allman is not with us tonight. Weinkoff Elementary School, Tracy Hogue. Wolf Meadow Elementary School, Cynthia Wagner. W.M. Irvin Elementary School and the Cabarrus County Schools District Teacher Assistant of the Year. Miss Sandra Hajney, and I want to um, I want to just talk a little bit about Miss Hajney. She served as a teacher assistant in Cabarrus County Schools since 2007. Hajney began her career as a registered nurse in New York. After relocating to North Carolina, um, she decided she wanted to work directly with children. She worked in daycare while earning a certificate in early childhood. In her current role, she works with students from kindergarten through fourth grade. She enjoys making children smile. She feels that she makes her greatest impact while helping students during reading intervention. And according to, the, to Principal Williams, Ms. Hageney is such a valuable staff member at Irvin Elementary. She is quick to support the various needs of our students and staff. Daily, you can find Mrs. Hageney giving hugs, high fives, and words of encouragement to students throughout the building. We are so grateful to have Ms. Hageney at Irvin Elementary. We want to congratulate all of our teacher assistants and a special congratulations to you.
Thank you, okay. Next, we'll have the Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month presentation. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair and board members again. Mr. Vaughn was not able to join us this evening. He might be off celebrating that um, Citizen of the Year Award he received at the Chamber. So congratulations to him and that well-deserved. But we do want to offer our sincere thanks and gratitude to him and to Hilbish Ford for funding this recognition program for outstanding teachers in our district. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce to you our Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month for February, Stacy Guerrero. Ms. Guerrero, would you, your family, and any members of your school's administrative team who are here tonight please come forward? You just stand right up there next to him. Okay. Stacy Guerrero is a first grade teacher at Charles E. Boger Elementary School. She was nominated for this award by a parent who wrote, 250 words are not enough to describe this extraordinary teacher or to explain what makes her so special. I was worried about my child at the beginning of the school year because she is it, the perfect definition of a shy child. Am I talking about you? <laughs> is that what I'm doing? Uh, Mrs. Guerrero welcomed her and all of the students into the class in such a loving and nurturing way. I often get messages from Ms. Guerrero to let me know how my daughter is doing during the day just because. She goes above and beyond to make each child in her class feel important and loved. She has made me, as a mother, feel completely comfortable and in the loop. Mrs. Guerrero never has a frown on her face. She is soft-spoken and honest. The teacher-parent communication blows me away. Although I can't be with my daughter throughout the day, I don't feel like I miss out on the important things. If I could choose to have Ms. Guerrero teach my daughter for the next 11 years, I would. Saying she is the best, and best is all capitals, would be an understatement. I cannot thank her enough for making my daughter and me feel so important, comfortable, and welcome. Mrs. Guerrero, congratulations on your selection as the Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month, and thank you for making your students and their parents feel welcome and cared for. Please allow Dr. Louder to present you with your award and then allow our board members to congratulate you. Next, we'll have the Impact Through Education Awards, Mrs. Ronnie Boone and Mr. Adrian Kaspar. Good evening. We're thrilled to present the Impact Through Education Awards tonight to deserving students and staff at Rocky River Elementary School and Central Cabarrus High School. I want to welcome Mr. Adrian Kaspar of AXA Advisors here this evening. As you know, AXA sponsors the Impact Awards for us this year, and we are so appreciative for their support. And we're also grateful to our partners at Concord Trophy and the Cabarrus Regional Chamber, who also helped to keep this program going. I also want to introduce to you Ms. Tina Playtech from J.M. Robinson High School. She's the broadcasting teacher there. 
and her students who are producing a special segment for our TV channel, Channel 21. So we thank you all for being here this evening and now on to tonight's awards. First up is Rocky River Elementary School and I would like to invite the Rocky River administrative team to join me here at the front of the room. Our first honoree from Rocky River Elementary School this evening is Erica Ketchum. Would Erica and her family please come forward? Stand by Mrs. Perry. Erica was selected as one of Rocky River's Impact Through Education student winners because she exemplifies what it truly means to be a roadrunner. Erica serves on the Student Council Executive Board, is on the school's flag patrol, and does the morning newscast. She is a reliable friend and always has the utmost respect for her teachers. She's always willing to help out a peer with a task they may not understand. Erica has been an invaluable help and built a lasting friendship with a newcomer student to Rocky River who only speaks French. Erica befriended the student and is always making sure her friend is following along in class and understanding the best that they can. Erica is a pleasure to teach and a great role model for all. Her heart for service and kindness to others has made a lasting impact on Rocky River Elementary School. Congratulations, Erica. Our next Rocky River Elementary School honoree is Gracie Lowe. Would Gracie and her family please come forward? Gracie is a breath of fresh air and smiles each time you encounter her. Every day she commits herself to serving her peers as a part of the Rocky River Safety Patrol. She greets students in the car rider circle each day and works to ensure everyone enters the building with a smile. Gracie has a commitment to service and helping others. She is a member of the Rocky River Student Council Executive Board and is always looking for ways to support others, even when no one is looking. Gracie is also committed to her learning and has such a perseverance that whatever she sets her mind to, she will accomplish. But it is her heart for serving others that has definitely made a lasting impact at Rocky River Elementary School. Congratulations, Gracie. Next, I'd like to have Ms. Noelle McGarry and her family please come forward. Ms. McGarry has the ability to connect with any student where they are and grow them to the potential she sees in them. Over the last four years, her classroom has become a model for the use of the whole brain teaching strategies, PBIS strategies, literacy strategies, and morning meeting. Ms. McGarry has a love for the students and families she serves and works to ensure all students succeed. 
She is an active member of the Rocky River Elementary School instructional team, where she has co-facilitated the development and implementation of school-wide professional development to enhance student literacy strategies and to develop a culture of reading. She is also a mentor teacher for beginning teachers and is always open to support any staff member in need. Ms. McGarry has a passion for education and knows that she is changing the lives of every student she encounters one moment at a time. Because of her dedication, her perseverance, and love for children, Ms. McGarry has made a lasting impact on Rocky River Elementary School, and we congratulate her on receiving this Impact Through Education Award. And our final honoree from Rocky River Elementary School this evening is Mrs. Lakeisha Madison Hemphill. Would Ms. Hemphill and her family please come forward? Mrs. Hemphill is the smiling face on the front porch of Rocky River Elementary School. Each day she greets every parent, student, and stakeholder who, stakeholder who comes to Rocky River. She has a whatever it takes attitude and that permeates the work she does daily. Mrs. Hemphill does whatever it takes to support Rocky River's teachers in making connections with families. She does whatever it takes to support parents and families in building connections with a staff member at the school. And she does whatever it takes to keep Rocky River running with efficiency to meet everyone's needs. Mrs. Hempel has a love for the students and families and does whatever it takes to ensure their success. It is because of her whatever it takes attitude, because of her love for the rock, because of her willingness to, uh, to build relationships to help families build connections with Rocky River, that she has made and continues to make a lasting impact at Rocky River Elementary School. Congratulations. And now for our Impact Through Education Awards for Central Cabarrus High School. I'd like to invite any members of the Central Cabarrus administrative team to come forward at this time. Our first honoree from Central Cabarrus High School is Hannah Giocondo. Would Hannah and her family please come forward? Hannah is a senior at Central Cabarrus High School and a lifelong native of Cabarrus County. She is a tireless worker, when not working either of her two part-time jobs, she is active in a variety of academic, athletic, and civic pursuits at Central Cabarrus. Most notably, Hannah is a member of the National Technical Honor Society, has held a variety of leadership positions in the Future Farmers of America Club, and is a member of the CCHS varsity softball team. Following high school, Hannah will attend Appalachian State University, where she plans to major in Spanish with a minor in communications. Through her world language studies at Central Cabarrus, Hannah has discovered a passion for the Spanish language and for international travel. Her future career goals include being an international flight attendant. 
One of Hannah's teachers shared that she is one of the most caring students I have ever taught. She will go out of her way to help her friends, family, and teachers. In addition, Hannah is well known for her steadfast approach to completing any task assigned to her. As part of a CTE independent study, Hannah needed chickens for a small animals project. In true fashion, she traveled more than three hours to get just the right ones in order for her project to be successful. When asked about her most influential experiences at Central Cabarrus, Hannah shared that her work through Future Farmers of America has been a huge part of her personal and academic development. These experiences have allowed her the opportunity to develop her leadership capacity, better understand the needs of her local community, and create lifelong friendships. Hannah exemplifies the Viking spirit, always thinking of others and how she can benefit her school and her community. Congratulations, Hannah, on receiving this Impact Through Education Award. Our next honoree from Central Cabarrus High School is Hannah Cameron. And Hannah couldn't be with us this evening, but I still want to read the information that was submitted about her. Hannah is a senior at, in the STEM program at Central Cabarrus High School. Her family moved to Concord when she was in fourth grade, and it has quickly become the place she considers home. Hannah is being recognized for the Impact Through Education Award because of her incredible work ethic and dedication to the Central Cabarrus community. Hannah is a founding member of the Central Cabarrus chapters of the Model UN and Spanish Honor Society. She's the treasurer for the Mu Alpha Theta Honor Society, the vice president of the STEM Think Tank, and the president of the Beta Club. She participated in the North Carolina Governor's School Program in the area of natural science and is currently a National Merit Scholarship semifinalist. In fact, she couldn't be with us here this evening because she's participating as a finalist in the prestigious Levine Scholars Program. Beyond her academic pursuits, Hannah has made a lasting impact on the community. She is a lifetime volunteer, a longtime volunteer at the Levine Cancer Center, supporting the comfort management of cancer patients. She also has volunteered for a local medication assistance program and has coordinated multiple charitable drives through her extracurricular activities at Central. Hannah's teachers describe her as a student with incredible drive. Hannah is relentless in her pursuit for academic excellence, while also being tireless in her efforts to support the community. Hannah shared that her most influential experience at Central Cabarrus is through her work on the STEM Think Tank, a problem-solving student group. It provided her the opportunity to delve into the realm of student leadership while also allowing her to, clearly, to more clearly understand her personal values, and better realize the community issues most important to her. Hannah's humble and determined approach to her academic, extracurricular, and civic pursuits is an example to others and a driving force in the positive impact she has had on the st students, staff, and community of Central Cabarrus High School. So we say congratulations to Hannah. <laughs> And our next honoree at Central Cabarrus High School is Kathleen Burke. Would Ms. Burke and her family please come forward? Katie Burke is the graduation coach at Central Cabarrus High School. She was born and raised in New Jersey, but relocated to North Carolina when her youngest daughter entered college at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Ms. Burke has spent the last seven years working at Central Cabarrus as an EC teacher and a graduation coach. She's being recognized as an Impact Through Education Award recipient because of her dedication to supporting the social, emotional, and academic success of students through helping them realize their goal of graduating high school. Ms. Burke is, is described by her colleagues as someone who believes in students regardless of the barriers they face. 
Her belief in students presses them to achieve goals they previously believed unattainable. When asked what she loves about her job, Ms. Burke shared that she appreciates the diversity at Central Cabarrus and loves that through her role, her current role, she's able to help all students. Ms. Burke's pe perseverance, work ethic, and creativity are undeniable, perhaps best evidenced by an anecdote from her childhood. At that time, Ms. Burke was growing up in New Jersey. Girls were not allowed to be paper boys, but she decided that she could not be denied. She used her brother's name on the application, and once on the job, her work sp spoke for itself. As a result, Ms. Burke unofficially became the first girl to have a newspaper route in New Jersey. Similarly, it is her refusal to accept the barriers that students face and her unrelenting belief in each student's potential that so greatly impacts Central Cabarrus High School. The school community is thankful for Ms. Burke and the impact she has had on CCHS students, families, and staff. Congratulations. And our final honoree from Central Cabarrus High School this evening is Ms. Norma Bostic. Would Ms. Bostic and her family please come forward? Norma Bostic is the data manager at Central Cabarrus High School, yet that job title only scratches the surface of her impact. She was born and raised in New Jersey. Following college, she taught biology outside of Atlanta, Georgia, while raising her two daughters with her husband of 34 years. Ms. Bostic has dedicated her life to education. In addition to teaching biology, she has spent the last five years in Cabarrus County as a testing coordinator and now as data manager. She's being recognized as the Impact Through Education Award recipient because through the trials and tribulations of all things power school related, Ms. Bostic stands resolute and unflappable. She is a calm, reassuring support for students, parents, and teachers. Ms. Bostic is described by her colleagues as someone who never gets flustered. Even when staff come to her with the same problems over and over, she politely and professionally helps each one. Many people would lose their cool, but she always makes staff feel supported. To this point, when asked what she loves about her job, Ms. Bostic stated, working with and helping our teachers. It is Ms. Bostic's service-oriented approach to her role as data manager that impacts Central Cabarrus High School at a level that goes far beyond data entry, grade reporting, and attendance reconciliations. Ms. Bostic plays an, an integral role in making Central Cabarrus High School a special place. Because of her impact on the school, Central Cabarrus High School is a better place to learn and work. Congratulations. Next, we'll welcome Mr. Michael Landers and the team for the King of the Court presentation. Before I turn this over to Mr. Landers, 
I just want to say that for many years now, the Cabarrus County Schools King of the Court Volleyball Tournament has been a very popular event among our high school students and also in our community. And so tonight we've got our, uh, some of the student leaders who are here along with Mr. Landers and community representatives to share the results of this year's tournament. So now I'll turn it over to Mr. Landers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, school board. We appreciate you taking time to, to recognize these students and what they do every year with this. We truly are in a remarkable county and educational system here. And I speak from the experience of seeing this thing grow since 2008. These students before you were only in first and second grade. And that is a testament to our school district in instilling community service, citizenship, and the value of helping others throughout all of their years. And it makes my job equally easy when they reach the high school level None of these students and the close to 500 other students across the school district that get involved every year do this not affiliated with any sports team, with any club, with any other academic program. They do it just because that's who they are and who they represent. And that's what amazes me. I don't contact a coach. I don't contact anyone else. I contact a couple of student leaders at each school we bring them in in June and, and, uh, or early in the school year, and we talk to them about the goal and what we're going to do, and then they go to town with it. So we're really proud this year to be breaking the $100,000 mark in total funds raised and donated since this started. And uh, they, they deserve a round of applause just for that. Now... This is truly unlike any other school district because I, get, I got emails in August from Stanley County. I got emails from Moran Salisbury Schools. I got some emails from Greensboro. And I got some emails from Kentucky. How do we do this in our schools? We, we want to do this just in our school. We're doing it across the county with 12 schools in our district, every single high school involved. And they come together for one night of fun and uh, competition, wearing pink, all with the eye on the goal, which is to help those with breast cancer. And so we're proud to, on the, my left side, uh, Kindle is standing with uh, Meredith Malden, representing Northeast Foundation and the Breast Health Center. So we have the, the medical care side covered with a donation this year of $13,226. And that brings these young adults total to over $92,000 just to the Breast Health Center. They literally helped to build the Breast Health Center um, since it has been opened. They've been funding things there. And then on this side, we have the emotional and spiritual support of those fighting this terrible disease. And two years ago, Lori Love, a Mount Pleasant grad, came to me and said, there's not a single uh, breast um, cancer support group in our area. And you find them all over the country. And we are starting one. And at the time, we had been long donors of the Vicki S. Honeycutt Foundation. And the Vicki S. Honeycutt Foundation um, stopped taking donations and took a pause, a moratorium on their foundations. They said, find another organization. I'm sure you can. The same year, the Pink Pals group started as official nonprofit. And this is our second year donating close to $5,000 for the emotional well-being of a cancer patients. So we're very proud and honored to con continue this tradition. And the last thing I'm going to say is, raise your hand, Madison. Madison doesn't know what she just agreed to, but Cox Mill agreed to host the event this fall and go figure the mill mentality in full effect. They already have picked out a date. So mark your calendars, October 23rd, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. at Cox Mill High School. They already have a date. This is the earliest any school has ever predicted a date. Um, but they figured it out and they're planning to blow it out of the water 
uh, this fall at Cox Mill and next year at Cox Mill. That'll make the six different Cabarrus County High School that it's been at since 2008. And I couldn't be more proud of these young adults and more uh, happy for the organizations that continue to get funding from teenagers. Thank you. I have stage four metastatic breast cancer, and all of the ladies here, uh, we have our volunteers. We also have women here tonight that are survivors of breast cancer. Our breast cancer support group is open to all residents, Cabarrus County and beyond, and all stages of breast cancer. So stage four thrivers and people who are just undergoing uh, their initial diagnosis and men. We have men members, so we're open to everyone and we're real happy that we were able to start this in August of 2017 and be the first breast cancer support group in Cabarrus County. And we couldn't do it without the awesome club. And so it really touches my heart to know that they have the heart for others. So thank you very much. And we have one more recognition this evening, and that's for the North Carolina Public School Relation or School North Carolina School Public Relations Association Blue Ribbon Awards. All right, in CSPRA. So we're going to ask Dr. <laughs> Louder and our communications team to come on up front. No, they're just going to stand there in glory. <laughs> So we're here tonight to recognize our NC Spra Blue Ribbon Awards. The North Carolina School Public Relations Association, that's a mouthful, so NC Spra is why we shorten it, seeks to promote excellence and professionalism in school communications. The Blue Ribbon Awards program recognizes association members for outstanding communications work. Our communications and public information department earned 12 in CSPRA Blue Ribbon Awards, the team which consists of Ronnie Boone, Aurelia Helms, and Mike Martin, who couldn't be with us tonight, attended an awards ceremony in Greensboro on February the 1st. And you wonder why we have Dr. Louder standing there? He actually received, an, outside the fact that he's superintendent, he actually was recognized for an award um, for his first day column back to school. So they were, one of the 12 awards that we received was because of his writing, that good English teacher there. So they received awards for projects in digital media engagement, photography, publications, marketing, special events and programs, electronic media and writing. The 12 awards they received brings the department's Blue Ribbon Award total to 59. That is impressive, folks. So congratulations to our communications team.
I'd like to thank Deputy Chris Dow from Odell Elementary School for being here tonight. Thank you. We always appreciate you. Board members, next we'll have the approval of the minutes. We have the minutes for the January 7th work session, January 14th business meeting, and our January 26th mid-year planning session. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Mr. Harrison made the motion. Ms. Grimsley made a second. Madam Chair? Yes. A couple of small technical corrections. Okay. On page one of the January 14 meeting minutes, um, under opening ceremony, uh, the first sentence should say the following cadets presented instead of will present the colors. Um, if you just give us a moment to open it. Sure, I'm sorry. Okay, and something else? Uh, yeah, on page three of those same minutes, under approval of minutes on the second line, should say approve instead of approved. Okay, those are just, like I said, technical corrections, right. not substantial, so. Right, and under the superintendent comments, second bullet point, third line, uh, should say time to learn. And I will amend the motion, hopefully with a second, for to accept those changes. Second. With those slight modifications. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, they approved 6-0. Um, from the report standpoint, I'm going to actually defer time to Mr. Walter to uh, talk about a concert we attended. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we had the privilege to attend um, the All County High School uh, Band performance. This was last sat Friday, Friday night and Saturday. And this is something that uh, Cabarrus County Schools is known to support the arts. So we have some our students at, I guess, all of our high schools and inviting A.L. Brown and CFA Academy so music students with a passion for music had the opportunity to come to J.M. Robinson for two days straight. Over 200 kids, I guess, in, in total. Um, they brought in clinicians from other areas of North Carolina to work with our students, and they came up with a performance at the end of, the, end of that time. Uh, something different this year that they did, they had a mo motivational speaker that came in to, to uh, work with leadership with some of these students as well. So all, all around, just a fantastic, uh, fantastic event that our band directors um, put together. So, you know, they were. They, it's not. A, it's not a competition. It's a collaboration. We had our band directors that spent all of those two days there. They stayed even for the, high, the middle schoolers on on uh, Saturday. So uh, next year, mark your calendars for early part of uh, February to attend the All County uh, <coughs> Band competi not competition but performance. Thank you, Rob. It was very impressive. Um, I had not gone to one of these uh, concerts for a couple of years, and it was like, oh my goodness, uh, the, the skill of these young people was amazing. So, very enjoyable. Dr. Lauder? Thank you, Madam Chair. First thing I want to do is recognize Mercedes Thomas, who is here with us um, in the audience. She got the short straw and um, has shadowed me all day long today. Um, she has lots of Cabarrus County roots to just tell you a little bit about her story. So we started out in the morning in a data meeting this morning with Mr. Cochran and she said, Hey, Mr. Cochran, he was my high school social studies teacher. Um, then ultimately, uh, she was a preschool teacher for 12 years. Then she was a TA for us for 11 years. And now she's become a certified, um, special ed teacher at ATL. And this is her third year and she's part of the beginning teacher network. So we're certainly very proud of her and the work that she's done, and she's been a, a joy to spend the day with today. So thank you for doing that. Um, I also want to uh, speak tonight about the importance of staying healthy during this cold and flu season. Uh, we are seeing an increase in flu-like symptoms across the county. The Cabarrus Health Alliance reminds us to cover our coughs and sneezes, wash hands frequently, and stay home when we are sick or have a fever. You can find additional guidance for this on the district website. Last week, we celebrated National School Counseling Week. I just want to make, take a moment to say thank you to our school counselors. Cabarrus County Schools is fortunate to have such a strong group of professional and dedicated school counselors who support our students every day. 
February is a month of celebrations. We're celebrating Black History Month this month. Events and activities are planned throughout the district to commemorate and recognize the contributions of African Americans to our country and to the world. We're also celebrating CTE Month. Cabarrus County Schools offer students a variety of career and technical education programs. These programs are helping to meet the challenges of economic development, preparing students for high skill, high demand, and high wage careers. February is also Love the Bus Month. This week, during Bus Driver Appreciation Week, we honor our bus drivers for their very important role in beginning lots of our students' days each day. We're thankful to them for providing students with a safe experience for riding the bus to and from school. We're also in the process of forming our budget for Cabarrus County Schools. We've had one meeting tomorrow is our second um, large meeting for that as we bring together about 40 people to work on um, our around $350 million budget. So we appreciate everyone that's participating in that as we work on making that as strong and strategic as we possibly can. Congratulations to Weddington Hills Elementary School for being named a National Magnet of Dis School of Distinction by Magnet Schools of America. It's a national association for magnet and theme-based schools. Congratulations also to Cox Mill High School's Wendell Moore Jr., who was named a McDonald's High School All-American. Wendell is the first player in the history of Cabarrus County basketball to achieve this honor. He will represent North Carolina during the most prestigious high school all-star basketball game in the nation as the only player from the state selected for the East roster. The 42nd McDonald's All-American Games will be held on March 27th in Atlanta and will be on ESPN. Also want to say congratulations to our own Bart Tolbert, our district's fine arts coordinator, on his selection to receive the 2019 South Central District Band Masters Association Award of Excellence. Bart was nominated by his peers, and he will receive his award at the North Carolina Band Masters Association Conference in November. Staying on the theme of fine arts, be also, also be sure to check out the Fine Arts Focus. That's a new section on our district website that serves as a one-stop shop for information about fine arts and events and activities across the district. One final reminder that Monday, February 18th, will be a regular school day. That's to make up for the missed school day on December 11th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ladder. And Ms. Abbott, do we have any guest speakers tonight? Okay, we don't, so we'll move on uh, to the next section the approval of the consent agenda board members we have several items we put on the consent agenda budget amendments policies on first reading and policies on second reading do i have a motion to approve the consent agenda so moved. Second. mr walter made the motion mr harrison aye. made the second all in favor say aye. aye any opposed okay that passes six zero thank you and we'll move to the action agenda the first item we have on here is the approval, which we could have actually put on consent, but I wanted to um, leave it for the ability to make comments. Um, the calendar resolution, which we reviewed uh, last week. I will share that I uh, spoke with Representative Linda Johnson over the weekend, and she looks forward to receiving our approved resolution. Uh, and she has already received some other communications from other districts. Uh, so she'll take that forward. How much success? There will eventually be, we don't know, but at least we will have uh, spoken uh, and provided some input to it. So do I have a motion to approve the calendar resolution? Second. Mr. Harrison made the motion and Mr. Walter made the second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, and that passes 6-0. Next we will have uh, section 9.02, the approval of policy 7720 for employee political activities on first reading. Is Ms. Reimers here for any uh, questions there might be? Do we have any questions or discussion? Oh, well, I was about to say, y'all really got even with me. I thought y'all cut my mic off. I said, boy, <laughs> we're a teacher. Uh, anyway, cut me off tonight. Um, just one question I have. I, I know we have been doing, putting the things in the mailboxes for years and years and years. And I know at the last meeting, y'all informed me that at least 11 school districts throughout our region were no longer doing this. Is this correct? I'm not exactly sure about the exact number. If we said 11 last week, I guess that was. Yeah. There are 11 districts in our region. So Ele 11 districts in our region that's not doing it 
one of the things I didn't know if we have done, and, and one of the reasons, you, you know me in safety, I'm a big safety freak, um, that I, I, I am concerned about that. But one of the things, the other side of that spectrum is that I do want to make sure that our teachers or that the uh, teachers and staff, they do have information on the candidates so they're knowledgeable of them and whether they would have that. That's my only concern. But the, on the other side of that spectrum, you know, I've heard some people say, man, that garbage, I don't do anything with except throw it in the garbage can. Uh, so that's the other side of that one. So I was wondering if there was any way that any kind of just brief survey is, do you like that garbage? Do you use that garbage? Uh, I mean, if, if that could be sent out through an email to see with the teachers, the principals, and the system principals to yeah. all our schools to say, hey, d is that really worth it? Yeah, Carol, Carolyn, I'll just say that I don't think we put policy decisions to surveys. Um, and there are public forums that teachers can attend, read things online. Uh, there was a link made available that a teacher's organization had uh, candidates answer questions that was made available online. So I think there's opportunity to receive information uh, without having you know, any amount of people going into the schools. Okay, I, I mean, this is a policy on employee community and political activities. Uh, I think it's too restrictive. I don't think we need to put more burden on our teachers. It really doesn't make much impact anyway if you read, read it for our, our employees, so I'm gonna vote against it. Any other comments? Do I have a motion to approve it? Is this for final approval on first reading? Is that what's intended here? Or just for first reading? For final appro for approval on first reading, it's the approval, not the discussion. So we have to approve it twice. Okay, so this is not asking for final approval on one reading? No, okay. it's right. approval on first reading, as stated. Do I have a motion to approve it on first reading? I'll motion to approve. Do I have a second? Okay, do we want to send it back to the policy committee? Okay, and those on the policy committee, if, if any board members have input, you need to send it to Ms. Reimers Burns so it's reviewed again with the policy committee. And Ms. Carpenter, you're on that committee. So I did you ex a, I mean, that was why I said I would really like to, I mean, we talked about it, oh, excuse me. We talked about this at, at length. That's why I would really like, I mean, we have, how many, how many principals? We, we brought extra principals, and I can tell you our principals were very adamant that they did not want to give access to the facility for many different reasons, mostly safety, but also access to students in general. And if you give it to one, you've got to give it to all. And this past year, we had quite a few people running and being able to say we felt great about letting anybody in our school in the middle of the day. Our principals were not for that. So I can speak for the principals. I can't speak for the teachers and for their staff. And that's probably where it needs to be at a different policy. This is really related to our employees and what our employees can do and can't do. So is that perhaps the solution? Make, um, I mean, employees still can't campaign during the school day they're working, and you can't use the email system to campaign and you know whatnot. So, do we recommend a separate policy for candidates in general? My understanding was this policy covered that, and the attorneys weighed in on that. Is that not correct? That is correct, and it does cover that as well. It speaks directly to it in the change. I don't know. When I read this, I see nothing here that says the community can't do this. This, this is specifically towards our, our employees and what our employees can do. Okay, so Mr. Walter, Mr. Harrison, Ms. Carpenter, you're on policy committee, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would suggest the three of you get together and figure out what to recommend to the policy committee because when they've reviewed it already and you guys are part of that committee, we don't expect changes to come when we're seated here because three of the seven of us have already participated in it. So. And Madam Chair, um, technically my motion to support the principals uh, failed for lack of a second. Yes, 
Yeah. <laughs> so it'll. Okay, so we'll send that policy back to Ms. Grimsley. I was just going to say, Madam Chair, I would like to have the attorneys to weigh in because it sounds like we did have a little bit of conflict there. So I'm kind of curious how that went with the attorney's recommendations. Yeah, it was Mr. Shy actually would have been at the policy meeting. This is actually their language, our attorney's language yeah. in the change. Okay, so we'll start new. We just want to make sure that we get past this before we have another election cycle. <laughs> so, okay. So we will move on. Uh, we will not approve anything uh, for 9.02. And we will move on to 9.03, uh, policy 9120, bidding up for construction work on second reading. Any questions? We had no yeah. feedback. Is that correct from the work session? That is correct. Why are we having it on action? Who, who asked for it for action? Yeah, I'm not sure who asked to have an ad. Was it you, Holly? Did, did, well, I didn't even look to see if the verbiage got changed to add the appropriate insured or and So I, I, we weren't sure what you wanted added, so we were going to have the attorneys look at that. So if you'll oh, send I'm that sorry. to us. It's okay. I'm sorry. It's I okay. thought you did. So, okay. I'll be glad to. I'll send it over. Okay. That's my fault. I did ask for some verbiage to be added that it should say something about the uh, bidder being appropriately insured and bonded. And we just said that I'd made that statement to uh, Mr. Louder, and I just assumed they'd... So is it okay to postpone this for a month? Is it going to make a big difference? Um, I well, or I would suggest, uh, Mr. Shaw, can you recommend? Not Mr. Shaw, I'm sorry, Mr. Schwartz, can you recommend um, what Ms. Grimsley is talking about? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking for. Alan. I had asked if we needed to have anything in there that stated also that the bidder would be appropriately insured and or bonded. That there's nothing that references anything about their insurance or their bonds. We had a, I had a history of an issue that happened when I was on the board um, years ago, and that seemed to have gotten it by the might, wayside. Uh, looking at this cold off the top of my head, I, it might be covered in here or in another policy. Um, but we can postpone this for a month. I don't think we're, it's going to do any harm. Okay, move to postpone it until next month. Okay, so no other changes other than uh, ensuring, ensuring it links to another policy or has the wording regarding bonding yeah, If we could cross-reference, that would be great because I didn't see anything in there that cross-referenced it. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's in the contracts with the board is, or pre-qualification, one of those two. So, okay, so we will postpone to um, the March work session. Okay, thank you, Ms. Reimer. Um, we now will go to section 9.04 regarding the sewer easement and the road right of way, Mr. Louder. <clears throat> yes, ma'am, Madam Chairman. Um, the Odell 73 investments has requested that we uh, provide an easement across the Odell School property that would, uh, one easement would house the future sewer line extension <clears throat> to connect to the line just below our property that would be owned by the City of Concord in the future. And then a, another small portion that would be on Long Highway 73 that once those improvements are complete would be dedicated over to NCDOT for their maintenance and future redevelopment, I'm sure. And then, of course, this goes from your approval then to Cabarrus County since they are holding the deed on the property uh, temporarily mm -hmm. while the financing is still available. Has there been any value placed on this? No, the, uh, the statement says that they will uh, it'd be valued through an appraisal expert recommended by Cabarrus County, and then that once the appraisal is finished and whatever that is, they'll, they'll pay it. So this <clears throat> approval would only be to... Let the commissioners know of our intent yes, to grant the right of way, not actually granting it. Yes, ma'am. And then the commissioners would actually grant the right of way uh, once they finalize the, the amount. So, does the revenue go to the commissioners or does the revenue come back the to the revenue us? would go back, I think, to the schools. So, how they do a roundabout way that it usually gets back to the school in which the right of way is crossing. Okay, so we need to put in the motion then 
uh, we approve uh, perhaps and pass along to the commissioners or whatever. So we're not approving the right of way because there's no value put to it at this point. So we're approving the intent really is what I'm thinking. Yes, right. ma'am, you are. And, Cabarrus, and actually, Cabarrus County has to approve the right of way since they own the property at this time. They just won't do it without your approval. So we're just saying we're not going to be using that, so it's okay for an easement? You're saying that as a school board, we have a problem with the easement, so therefore, Cabarrus County can go ahead it's and not gonna it. affect, It's not going to affect the school operations or anything? Yes, sir. <clears throat> so the motion that I would like to say then is that the board approves the intent to grant a sewer easement and road right of way request, um, and now it will go to the commissioners. So, do I have a motion to um, approve uh, our intent, this board's intent, to grant a sewer easement and road road right of way <laughs> uh, based on the diagrams and information we have before us? Second. So, Ms. Grimsley made the motion, Ms. Carpenter made the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, and then we'll hear hear back on it again. Okay. Okay, and next we have um, what's just generally labeled as a board discussion on student realignment. So, um, I was collecting feedback from board members. Um, it became clear very quickly that um, the folks who responded were kind of all over the place <laughs> with changes. And it was very difficult to organize and manage in different formats and uh, with a lot of different um, uh, changes. So there's a couple of things I just want to say and then we can uh, kind of go round robin and make comments or whatever. So uh, one thing is uh, I'll just lead off with no one ever said being a board member was easy. These are some of the worst things <laughs> we have to deal with. I mean, there are obviously other difficulties, but it's very hard uh, when parents come before us, email us, uh, and express their concern about their children uh, staying at one school or another. Um, overall, it is the duty of each of us, individually and collectively, to be responsible to the citizens and taxpayers of the county as a whole and to make well thought out decisions. In considering a realignment of multiple schools, we have taken on the task to use the available classrooms at some schools to relieve overcrowding at other schools. When we buy land to build a school, often that land is further out and all of these homes are not around there at that time. Quickly, the land around the school becomes desirable for developers and families move in. We need to keep closing in the attendance zone or that circle around the school. Um, and that leads us to where we are now, needing to make the adjustments to have room for current and future students. And I like to use the example of um, Central Cabarrus, when it was originally built, it was not on the edge of that school district for Central Cabarrus High School. Now it's right on the line almost. Um, we never know what will happen over future years. You can't predict how the economy will roll uh, or what developers may be interested in where. So I'm going to suggest as a board that we um, approach the solution, and you kind of saw that with the base spreadsheet that I sent out. Um, we approach it by level of school, elementary, middle, and high, kind of looking at them separately. Um, and what schools are affected and why. So uh, just before this meeting, I sent you all a, a spreadsheet that I got late this afternoon about mobile units. It has the school capacity on there. It has the number of mobile units in use. And it has the max number of mobile units. So that's just as a point of reference. So as I was going through comments yesterday and doing my own research, I thought, gosh, we need some more data. Um, not that we didn't have a ton of data already, but we need some more. Um, the starting point or the baseline will be the committee's recommendation for each level of school. Off of that, then, we will do pluses and minuses. I'm going to add some columns to the spreadsheet um, that will have, if we do what you're suggesting, what each of you might suggest in one row in that spreadsheet, let's say for uh, high schools, uh, add somebody into West, an area into West Cabarrus High School, then I need you to put in there how many students are you adding in and we'll start watching the tally increase unless we move somebody out. So in the balance, every planning block removed from scope should be moving approximately the same number of students in scope. So if you think a, a certain district that the committee came up with is a little jagged on the edges 
and maybe the traffic flows better if we make a tweak here or there. Um, I want you to make those recommendations as well. Um, the exceptions being, for example, a school like Coltrane Webb, uh, which is really not affected by this, but they're landlocked for growth. They have a finite area in downtown Concord, and there's really not any big construction that can happen from there. Um, so there's only a few schools that have that. Most of them do have some land that is being developed near or around them. Um, just to touch on, we will um, be publishing a grandfathering guideline. Typically, we only grandfather uh, the high school seniors at their original school. That changes the numbers. That, that high school stays high for that extra year. The new school is low. Um, and that's only grandfathering, and actually we need to think about that too, grandfathering if we're redistricting versus just for the new schools. So we'll try to get those guidelines out so everybody's thinking and, and we agree on that. Um, from a schedule standpoint, I don't think um, that we are going to be ready in March to do this, which actually may help the timing with the Beverly Hills study as well. So what I'm going to suggest is that... Um, and Ms. Reimer will be checking in if this is possible, that in or for the March work session, that we keep the agenda as light as possible and that we have Matthew Cropper come back and kind of walk us through the plus and minus. But we need to have all of our questions and, and requests for movement to him a few weeks before that. So you all really will have a final deadline. I'll send that back out to you with what I have in the spreadsheet so far, um, to add your comments in so Matthew can review them and figure out how best to guide us through that conversation. If he is not available for the March work session, uh, we'll look at another evening at about 5.30 uh, to have, we'll sit on the floor, we'll have the pictures of the maps in here um, and go through that discussion. I think that will be helpful to kind of walk through it. Um, I was getting lost in maps last night, <laughs> and I'm sure other people were too. So to really look at and see what uh, some of the requests from parents, for example. So um, from the emails we got, you know, each neighborhood would like their area to stay exactly where they are. If you do that, we have nowhere to go at Harris Road Middle School. We have nowhere to go at Cox Mill High School. We can't keep everything the same. Um, Unfortunately, that area has grown, and if you just take a drive on Cox Mill Road from Poplar Tent going south, and there is plenty more uh, houses being developed and people, families adding in, so it, it is a challenge. Um, so tonight, uh, if you make comments, I'll just ask you to, to log them in the spreadsheet so that we make sure we keep track of everything. Uh, and then it's you giving us your words, not worrying about um, somebody misinterpreting what you said. Um, so, and Ms. Carpenter, from uh, your concern about the timing with Beverly Hills, we will be further along uh, and maybe have a better idea of is it going to be reasonable, you know, to build on that site. Uh, but regardless, from the um, having availability to the students at Beverly Hills, if we are able to build there and it gets put into the county budget at some point, um, we still have to vacate that school. We can't build like Weinkoff did, where you built in front of the other one with that steel wall between them. Um, so we still have to vacate at some point. So, but what I'm gonna suggest, so you can start the comments, but is that we each hit our mic button no more, and, and I'll count this as my first, no more than two times tonight so that we can make your comments, jot down notes. So if you think of something new, get it in your spreadsheet and get those back to me. Uh, but maybe we'll you know, at least have some idea of where everybody is. So Ms. Carpenter, would you like to start? I'll always <laughs> start. Uh, and and, and thank, I want to thank Rob again because unlike the rest of you, I have an iPad, so mine will not go into that spreadsheet. So Rob is having to put my notes into my spreadsheet. And, and I'm just going to tell you, Carolyn, the format you sent them in didn't copy well. So if in the future, maybe you can come over and get with Mindy um, and, you know, let her know what to fill in or whatever, um, because it didn't, uh, 
Rob did a stellar job of trying to get it in, but there were still things that were off I had to go fix later. Um, so maybe that would be a good option if you have time to come over here. Well, so. she was not here. That's why we couldn't use Mandy. She was gone. Oh, on Friday, yeah. And then yeah. so we were, tr and it was the weekend, and you wanted it by a certain yeah. date. So we could not do that option uh, to get within your timeline. Uh, so we had a, we were pressed for time. Again, this is such an important thing. I don't want to be pressed for time. And that's why I personally would like to say, you know, not even look till before May. Because, again, I, we are not even getting the, the Beverly Hills study even given to us before April the 1st. And again, we need some time to digest it, to look at it, and we've got to, this board has not voted on anything, so it would have to have something put somewhere, whatever it says. And you're saying, well, you've got to move those people. You know, there's 400 seats there, give or take, you know, we got 400 seats in that school, and so they, they are 400 seats in that school right now. And so they, there's 400 seats no matter what. So they're there. They are there. So you, you're going to throw those out the window? I'm here. We're screaming for seats, so you've got those there. So... We, this board has not voted on anything, one way or the other. So we need time to look at whatever that study says. This board, the new board, has not voted on anything. We need to vote on that. Uh, so I want to make sure we get that study and we do, you know, we look at that and make a decision. So I think that's something would need to be done on that. I don't know what the other board members are doing, but I, all the blocks and all the uh, suggestions that I had put on my sheet, I am trying to go to all these subdivisions and go to all these blocks and trying to do it at the time when the schools are getting out so I can see what the traffic is. And I'm trying to go to each one of them in my car. I'm a touchy-feely person. I like to see the things. So I'm trying to get to all those. So it's going to take a little time for me to do that. And if I want to have the full picture, you're saying, well, let Mr. Cropper come here to tell what the study is. We're not going to have this full picture unless you get the county to tell me <coughs> how many permits or how many houses has actually have been released since he started the study. I'm not going to have a full picture because I don't know how many other houses that actually have been put on the books since that, that study was started. So I'll know how many to add to what they actually have. So I'm not going to have a full picture because I know for a fact that all those new houses that were built across from Odell are not in his study. And you've already got, if you look at those totals, he's got Odell at max. So I don't have a clear picture. And then you're wanting to bring more over there. So I don't have a clear picture. So I want a clearer picture of what's going on. So I have a clear study. And then the other question is, on our 10-year plan, when you look at his numbers for what our McAllister is, he's only showing 262 students K-5, but then in our 10-year plan, we say we want to build an 800-student school. Why? Where are we getting those students from? What are we closing? Or what are you? why are you building an 800 student school if you've only got 262 students in that district. So that's my comment. Okay, Ms. Grimsley, you want to go next? You know, it's just like I told you earlier, I'd like to see all the comments from everyone first uh, so that we don't duplicate, but a lot of that information is really good. I think the update 
uh, from all the information when they first started would be real uh, important for all of us. So I, I was kind of curious, you know, when we did the redistricting when I was on the board to begin with, you remember how we did the charts where they were able to move it as we worked with it and kind of give us an idea of what we were doing as we did that, S similar to the charts you've got, but actually they were able to do it live. Um, I mean, I guess it's going to be confusing even if we get that all this is, information This back. one is a little more scientific with having to count per planning block. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's actually to our benefit. We will be getting another list of all the planning blocks and number of students. Mm -hmm. So when we um, get that, you'll be able to see, hey, I, I really think we need to move this section one way or the other, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to see how many students are in there. But are they so, going to be able to update? Uh, I know just like Ms. Carpenter was talking about, some of the build outs are not in some of their information but it's because they you know probably just after they first got started but will that be updated by that meeting that they are going to come um, to present i don't think he'll be updating it live because we have a committee recommendation mm -hmm. people worked on this for the last six months so this isn't new and i'm hoping he'll be able to shed some light on the pros and cons from the committee so how would we know about the build out so they're actually in progress I mean, I know uh, that's a million-dollar question. Yeah, it was a little different uh, approach, I think, not counting permits like really it used important. to be. But that's really important. I mean, that really in, was. In the projections. Those yeah. build-outs are in the projections. You've got updated numbers for this school year now mm -hmm. from last year, and they are already built into the Kibben's projections and proper components of that. Yeah. So okay. They are okay. Maybe once they present, yeah, it'll be. Like how, what they looked at, it, that's how he got his projections. Okay. Years. Okay. Looking at Mr. Walter? Um, let me just, I guess my first time will just be high, sc high school. <laughs> and just looking at the map, there's, again, there's some outliers that I don't understand how they got, uh, how they made the, the lines where they made the lines. And that's kind of like to see that, that information. You know, <laughs> such as the area up at 73, the most of the acres area seems to be cut out. Uh, for the new West Cabarrus High School, there's an area over by Concord Mills that's cut out. There's an area down in Harrisburg that was cut out and not included in the J.M. Robinson. I don't understand why, um, and I'd like the information about that. Well, like I said, everything has to be written down. I'm not taking notes on all your requests, so. But he will be here. He yeah. should be able to explain that. Is that is Yes, that but you need to ask the questions ahead of time so he can prepare, and if it's data staff has, staff can give it to us. So there shouldn't be anything new requested when he comes and we have a work session. So everything we want ahead of time. All right, well, I'll type that out and send it to you. But yep. uh, those things seem, you know, those things jump out at you. Um, and then, you know, part of that is, again, we have criteria more than just utilization. And without ranking that criteria, I don't know, that would make it difficult for me to, to exactly 100, <coughs> make a determination on keeping something in and keeping something out. Some of the other things that stand out to me that jump jump out right out is uh, Concord High School. We're taking students from that school. Uh, the school is already underutilized. I think wherever that number came down to, um, it goes down to 79%. We don't replace those students. Um, so what happens when you take students from, from a school, you lose teachers. You lose programs, you lose opportunities. There, I, that, that I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. There's an area that's on the south side of that district that's taken out to Mount Pleasant. There's only I think 13 students there. Why would you take those 13 students out of Concord and take the 100 that you're taking out from to West Cabarrus? Just doesn't make sense to me. But those are my questions on the high school up. Okay. Ms. I'm just going to say I am so glad that we are not doing this in a rush because I spent hours looking at all of these maps last night and literally my eyes started to go cross. So um, I absolutely agree with Holly and what Carolyn said, um, especially because one of my concerns was the future growth. Um, the neighborhoods that are coming. And so what is that going to do for Cox Mill? What is that going to do for Odell? Um, so I'm definitely interested in, in hearing a little bit more about the new neighborhoods and the new amount of students that are going to be coming to that area. So 
Thank you okay. for not rushing this. Mr. Harrison? Well, I might be saying some of the obvious here. Um, I don't think I'm smarter than 28 people. And the committee has done um, just yeoman's work to reach the conclusions they've reached. And it's our job, yes, to um, exercise the oversight and be certain that it's a good plan for the whole county that can be sustained in the long run. Um, I'm sure we are going to make adjustments to whatever is finally um, uh, done in the option one or the recommended option, I believe is the um, uh, main direction that we're going to go in, but then make some additional changes to that. Um, option one for me somewhat balances the overall student population countywide. It moves 300 students, 300 fewer students um, in its um, recommendation. It addresses more of the family concerns or the concerns that were stated by uh, families about um, the options. <clears throat> and it does a really excellent job of relieving overcrowding, as best as I can read the data, um, at A.T. Allen, Cox Mill Elementary, Harrisburg Elementary, Patriots Elementary, Hickory Ridge Middle, somewhat at Harris Road Middle, as well as relieving some of the overcrowding at Central Cabarrus, Cox Mill, Hickory Ridge, and Northwest uh, Cabarrus High School. Um, it does a good job also of exposing more of the uh, Jay and Freeze um, community and neighborhood to the benefits of STEM education. And you, got, you, you scout guys in the back, get all the STEM education you can. And <clears throat> it also does, um, um, it maybe allows the county to, um, you know, make reasonable adjustments for the, the alternative because the alternative of, of not having a good plan um, that we can implement is more mobile classrooms and is more buses and is real dollars and cents um, that would fall back on the county if we don't have a good plan for the whole county. Um, I wish the plan would do more for the overcrowding, again, as best as I can understand the data, um, at Carl Fur, Mount Pleasant, Royal Oaks, Weddington, and Wolf Meadow. So maybe we'll have some good ideas for that, I think. And um, I, I still would like to see um, some information made available to uh, parents about um, drop-off and pick-up sites for uh, the busing and the transportation that we can provide. Um, I have a few other concerns. I can. I'm I have sure a few other concerns. Drop off and pick up sites. I, I'm just talking about um, the, the the busing and the transportation offerings that we can make um, as we uh, make these plans and put them into place. It would be good at yeah, some point. Transportation won't be a part of this discussion. Or the outcome after we do a realignment would be. So it can't, it can't be known this early until the. I wouldn't think the so. The alignment can be. Because um, you don't know what people in. were making. No, I don't mean decisions. to make a projection about it. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you're, you're correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, I've got a f one or two other concerns I'll, sh I'll just share in private. But um, for the most part, I think it's a strong recommendation. And I think we would do the county a, uh, a great service to um, accept the recommendation of those 28 committee members. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other comments? We'll continue to study. We have some additional information tonight about the mobile units. And like I said, we'll get other information from Mr. Cropper and then we'll schedule um, what I'll call walk around work session. So. Just one more question for Tim Lauder. How many seats are at West Cabarrus? 
It's, it's built for 18, not 16. Okay. That's with the third floor, correct? Yes. Okay, so board members. Um, 1850. Okay. Um, board members, please uh, gather your questions. So Rob was asking about process type stuff. Um, by next Monday, end of day, so that we can get those to Mr. Cropper to get answered about how the committee operated um, and what the committee liked or didn't like about certain things. Um, I will adjust that spreadsheet, send it back out, ask you all to fill it out with your plus and minus recommendations. Um, like I said, and it will require, if you're taking somebody out of scope, where are you going to swap those students? So uh, the goal will be to have only one more public hearing. Um, so if anybody gets added into scope, then we'll start hearing from those families. So it's kind of, uh, Rob used the phrase earlier, it's a domino effect. So you change one thing, you trickle down and change a few more things. Um, and then I don't want us to dig ourselves into a bigger hole. <laughs> Um, than you know the people who already don't want to move. So um, anyway, so Monday, February eighteenth, and at that point, I will say, <laughs> speak now or forever hold your peace. There was one. I think there was an option D. Can we take a look at that? Is that something that could yeah, be put, they put on there? Were fine to that. Yeah, that was from a committee member who didn't agree with the committee's final recommendation. But we'd still like to look at it. Um, but it won't be in the interactive maps. It will be. I think it's in uh, that person referred to uh, all the meeting minutes are online. Session five. Session five, yeah. So you could, should be able to go there and read it. I can't just add it back. I thought it was already on there at one point. It is, but we're not considering the other recommendations. Our baseline is. Yeah, I, under, I understand that, but I yeah. just wanted to compare it to see what the differences were. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to stick with we need to use the committee's recommendations baseline. Uh, that email gave a lot of detail. So otherwise, if we start bringing in every option this committee looked at, I think there were 13 at one point, it's really going to get out of control quickly. So as David so nicely said, we had 28 committee members who boiled down and got things down to this recommendation. Um, I was really hoping we weren't going to uh, kind of hunt and peck on what we liked or disliked as much. There's some things you have to upset, accept, if you will, in a way, because um, of where the student populations are. And as I use the Central Cabarrus example, it's not sitting in the middle of the school district anymore. Um, it's just the nature of where the growth happened. So we can't control that. So now we have to try to work with it. So um, see what you can find there. And if anything, he can give us paper maps, but I'm not going to ask him to load up every other option. Um, into the database again. I don't think that's fair to the committee and it's not respectful of them. So. so any other questions before we go into closed? Uh, but one of the things, I mean, basically, I mean, I appreciate their work, but their work was to give us a recommendation mm -hmm. and we are the final person that makes those decisions. You're right. And that committee, Mr. Cropper, he was paid to do a job and to do that, and he's going home. We are the ones, and the parents and the children, they're the ones that's got to live with it. And we are the decision makers, and we are the ones that are going to have to live with that. And those people are going back home. I do appreciate having, having to do that. But we are the decision makers, and it's always going to be our person. We are the ones that have to make that final decision. You're right. I'm just trying to manage everybody wanting a lot of different changes, and sometimes what one person wants is in conflict with what another person wants. So in order to manage the totals, because to this point, um, I have not asked you to log your questions, your request with your plus minus on the students. When you start looking at, I wanna take all of these people out, we leave Harris Road and Cox Mill High School overflowing. Um, so we, we need to look at those numbers. It can't just be a comment, it needs to be a responsible comment. 
to say if I don't want to include a certain area in the redistricting, then how am I going to make this balance because we're out of mobile unit room at some places. And the mobile units with technology are costing us about 100000 right? So do we want to continue buying mobile units when some redistricting will allow us to put students in schools? We need to be financially responsible. Well, that block had that number. It has that number in there. You can see the numbers online, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can show you how to do it if you want. Okay. Um, so, yeah, these, these are never fun. Uh, Carolyn, you've been through enough of them. Holly, you and I have been through quite a few. Um, you know, I don't want to throw a wrench in the system, but just since you said that, you know, I think what's a little, um, I don't know, I guess frustrating, maybe not be a stronger word, but we were a part of those initial in 2008 through 10, and we got to see all the different plans and all the different, you know, so now I feel like we're, maybe missing the new members, you know, being back, being new. I think I just want to make sure if there were some other options that, you know, I, don't, I, I know it's it's hard to bring it all back, and, and they did do some good work, and I know it, and they really did work hard on it, but I think this, the, the way that y'all have done it this time, me not being a part of it, you know, it may be a perfect system and work out just fine, but it kind of takes the board out of it from the initial part Well, of you it. can see all the original maps still out there. It's just not in the interactive map. Because I think that would and it probably cause, from a database standpoint, it to be very difficult to load. It already takes a little bit to load, and you change your different settings you want on it. So, you know, so my request is we use the recommendation as the baseline. You might get some great ideas by looking at the previous uh, meeting minutes and all those, the attachments they have out there. Okay, I'd still like to see if Carpa could send, send us the GIS data so I can look at it. If it. Even if it's not here on the interactive, I'd like to see it. Yeah, well, we're not giving GIS data out publicly. I don't want it um, publicly. I want it from, for, to review. Yeah, that's, Inter internally, I'd like to review it. That's student data so um, and addresses. I don't think we can do that. Um, but anyway, so let's see. Mr. Cropper, the prop, maps are probably there. I haven't looked for every one of them to look at the previous um, information. So, And then, like I said, there may be nuggets of, gosh, I like that format of that particular area of the county better. So... But you will have to do your, your research to fill out so we can give Mr. Cropper the, um, the areas of concern so or suggestions for change. Can I just add something, too? Uh -huh. um, so one of the things that I did notice as I was going through a lot of this material from the Cropper uh, information, it specifically said in there, this is to be used as a resource. All of the information that the, the committee came up with was to be used as a resource, not as the determining factor of the board. Oh, no, I, and I agree with you. I'm just saying we have to, so that we're all talking to the same map. We're going to use the recommendation as the baseline. Otherwise, when we look at the plus and minus, if you use map D and I use map C, then what I write in there may not apply to you. That way we're all dealing from the same base. But what we're doing now is we're comparing the recommended against option two. So there are two to compare against. I'd just like to see the option, the other option that I can compare that against the recommended. Yeah, there are maps. Um, when I'm looking down the meeting materials, there are maps in every one of those uh, options online. And he may, um, do you know if we still have the big maps that he had at, like Robinson on display there? That we could. Um, yeah, I'm not asking for it to be printed. I'm asking so I can click between one and two, one and two and compare like I have been for the last several days on this stuff. Yeah, we can talk to him, but I'm worried about the database being overloaded that He's okay, only he, can got just, so many, he can send the data. I've got so a GIS many points program in there. here on the computer. So. Okay, so again, February 18th, please get all of your questions, and it needs to be in the Excel format um, so that we're not needing to reformat and guess what people mean when we get it in paragraph form or whatever. Okay, are we ready to go into closed session? Uh, let me read this first. <laughs> I'll take a motion and a second that the board convene in closed session pursuant to general statute 143, 318, 1183 to consult with an attorney or preserve the attorney-client privilege 
and to receive advice regarding the case of Leanne Matthews versus Cabarrus County Board of Education et al. and pursuant to General Statute 143, 318-11A1, to consider student matters that are confidential pursuant to General Statute 115C-402 and 28 U.S.C. 1232G and pursuant to the General Statute 143-318-11A6 and A1 to consider personnel mat personal matters that are confidential pursuant to the Statute 115C-319-321. So David made the motion. Second. Ms. Grimsey made the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, we are now in closed session. Thank you for those here uh, and good evening.